All right, good evening, everybody. Tonight, we'll be talking about one of my favorite subjects. It's going to be eternal security. So OSAS, once saved, always saved. So a lot of people, they, I notice that, especially online, that they're against that. Uh, they hate that doctrine, and they also believe that it is blasphemy and heresy. And the reason why is because they do not believe in dispensationalism. The number one thing I hear from people, what they appreciate about dispensationalism the most, is concerning salvation. Salvation. So, for example, uh, if... So, concerning the doctrine of salvation... Sorry about that, my intention just went away just now. So, concerning the doctrine of salvation, a lot of people appreciate it the most concerning dispensationalism. Because there are too many verses that show that you can lose your salvation. If you uh, don't keep the faith, then you can uh, lose your salvation. You can go to hell after you believed on Christ. <clears throat> so the thing is, is that concerning eternal security, that's why it's understandable a lot of people, especially online, would think that it's heresy. Eternal security, listen now, eternal security is a basic doctrine. That's not an advanced theological concept. That is a basic doctrine that every new believer should understand and know. So tonight's teaching is going to be especially important for all of you. If you don't know this doctrine, then uh, don't bother even getting into the deep stuff. This is foundational. It's even becoming a heavy debate on deep doctrine now. But this is a foundational doctrine for every believer. In fact, it's probably the first doctrine you hear after you get saved, yep. believe it or not. Believe it or not, sometimes that's the case. Okay, so let's talk about eternal security. So you guys don't have the paper for it. The reason why <clears throat> is because in this teaching, we're going to go through all the verses together. So that's why you don't need uh, your papers for this. You'll be able to catch up in your writing, so don't worry about that. The famous chapter. Now, you're going to have to remember this one. The most famous chapter for eternal security is 1 John chapter 5. That is the most famous chapter on eternal security, and you want to make sure that you know that. So whenever you show a person a verse on eternal security, uh, you're going to base it off of 1 John chapter 5. And if the cameraman can let me know if I'm out of bounds, uh, on the side or below any time, then I'd appreciate that. Gotcha. All right, the first one is 1 John chapter 5, and then verse 11. The most famous... If not the most, one of the most famous passages on eternal security. <clears throat> and this is the record. So notice it's recorded. It cannot be erased. That God hath given to us how much life? Eternal life. And this life is in His Son. This is very plain. He that the Son hath life. So if you receive Christ for your salvation, you automatically have life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have eternal life. It's that simple. There's no in-between here. Verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Yeah. So did you believe on Jesus Christ? If you did, that ye may what? No. Oh, I don't know if, uh, I hope I can go to heaven. No, you do know you're going to heaven if you had faith on Christ. That ye have how much life? Temporary life? Did it say conditional life, like under the condition of sinning, under the condition of uh, failing your faith? No, that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So several things to note in this passage in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. <clears throat> we saw one, that it mentions eternal, that's fixed. Another thing we noticed right here is that it's also record. That's a strong word. Not just eternal and record, but also you see the word no. Another thing is that, here's the fourth thing, basically notice that once you believed, you are saved. <coughs> it says believed, then you have life. Verse 12 and verse 13. It's that simple. It never said work. Did you see work there? 
No, you didn't see work there. Did you see baptized right there? No. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's another powerful one. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, you can actually go through this whole chapter, but we don't have time to read this whole chapter. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 15 all the way through 27. Now, why is it that whole passage? Because this whole passage is about the body of Christ. Now, based on Jesus Christ's body, there are several factors to consider here. First, the Bible says that it is impossible, it is impossible <clears throat> to lose a member of the body. Now, why is that? Why is it impossible to lose a member of the body? Because then there would be no body of Christ. Isn't there a body of Christ? Yeah. But if you say there's no member, one of the members in the body of Christ is lost, then that means the body of Christ cannot even exist. There would be no body. So let's look at the verse. Verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, see, if it's only one member that counts for salvation, the whole body is an eye, then where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? So notice right here, uh, verse 19 as well, and if they were all one member. So it's only certain members that are truly saved. If you say it that way, and if they were all one member, where were the what? Body. The body of Christ wouldn't exist. All members are saved, you got to understand. All members are saved once you receive Christ for your salvation. A second argument right here <coughs> is that you'll notice the one that is less honorable is made up. God lifts the person up. He abundantly fills it. The less honorable is filled with abundant honor. So yeah, there's probably a person in the church who's less honorable, does not really qualify for the honors in the body of Jesus Christ, the special honor society of Jesus Christ. No, no such thing. Because God, he can fill it up, make up, for their less honorable defects, their slip-ups. We're going to keep reading right here. Verse 23. And if those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, right? How many people online, how many pastors and false prophets think, oh, you're less honorable. You're less honorable. Okay? Upon these we bestow what? More abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no meat. But God hath what? Tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Oh, there's something lacking in my part with my walk with Jesus Christ. There's something that I'm lacking in the Holy Spirit or in my salvation. No, God makes up for it. God makes up for it. Thirdly, this is powerful. There is no schism in the body of Christ. That's powerful. So no matter what sin you may commit, you cannot be divided from the body of Christ. It's not like when you get saved in the body that Jesus Christ automatically divides you out when you sin or you mess up. The Bible says there's no schism, no division. God cannot cut it off. Let's look at verse 25. That there should be no what? Schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Wow, that's powerful. Isn't that powerful? <clears throat> Here's a famous passage for eternal security is John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 27 through 30. <clears throat> so, John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. This passage, you all have to remember this one. This is the second or one of the most famous passages on eternal security is John chapter 10. So this one is something that you have to know because a lot of pastors in this area, 
well, I'm not going to give them that much benefit of the doubt, but some pastors, they know this one. This is because this is a famous passage. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them what? Eternal life, and they shall what? Never perish. You can't go back to perishing. It's never. Neither shall what? Any man pluck them out of my hand. That's powerful. You can't slip out of your salvation. But hey, it's not just God the Son, Jesus, who eternally secures you. It's also you got a backup. You got God the Father as well eternally securing you. Because look at verse 29. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Isn't that powerful? That is extremely powerful. So, we don't believe in eternal security. You might say, what, Pastor? What did you just say? Yeah, I don't believe in eternal security. I believe in double eternal security. That's how secure I am in Jesus Christ. Man, isn't that a blessing? So this verse is powerful because... Why is it double eternal security? Because you got the backup of the Son and the Father. But hey, I'm going to stretch it even further. Let me stretch the blasphemy to people who hate OSAS. I believe in triple eternal security. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> because I got God the Holy Spirit who also secures my salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Verse 13. This is a strong verse, Ephesians 1.13. It's a great verse to memorize. Soul winners, memorize this verse. So if you're a soul winner, you should memorize this verse. Okay? You should memorize this verse if you're a soul, soul winner. In whom he also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that what? Holy Spirit a promise. The Holy Spirit seals you unto what? Look at verse 14. Verse 14, it reads, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. That's the rapture. Wow, look at this. The Holy Spirit seals you till the rapture. Isn't that powerful? Now, some people may not understand, okay, why does verse 14, redemption of the purchased possession, praise of his glory, refer to the rapture? It's very simple. All you have to do is compare that with Romans chapter 8, which we won't turn to for time's sake. But if you look at <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 23, that verse shows that that is the rapture. Redemption. Purchase possession, praise of his glory. So just look that up if you don't believe me. And then, whoop, my bad. So you'll notice right here, if you especially look at Romans chapter 8, that you are sealed all the way. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23. And because we live in such a television generation where people get bored unless I don't do different colors, let's go... Let's go to the next color as we go to this next column right here. So, I believe in triple eternal security. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> uh, the other one, 1 John chapter 3. I love this verse. Another great verse for eternal security. 1 John. You know, there are some people who don't think that the book of 1 John can be used for eternal security. They think that that is solely for the tribulation, and because of that, they miss a lot of blessings on eternal security. Look at this. This is perhaps one of the most famous, if not the most famous, on eternal security. And there are a group of heretics that you got to avoid called hyper-dispensationalists. What they are is they will use the term Berean and grace quite often. That's a red flag. It's really easy to tell who they are, is when they mention grace, and they mention Berean. And you're going to find out that they stress so much on the Apostle Paul, Paul, and Paul. Now, we dispensationalists, we do believe like Bereans, we should search the Scripture. We believe in the grace of God. We believe the Apostle Paul has shown a lot of things concerning Christian doctrine. 
But the thing is this, we do talk about Jesus at least once in a while. We do talk about Moses, the Old Testament, once in a while. I do get upset if they knock off the Ten Commandments out of public schools. Yeah, because this is part of the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. If it's just your beloved Apostle Paul, all of you would have Bibles this thin. Amen. All of you would have Bibles that thin. First John, yes, it contains many tribulation application. I taught that. If you teach that First John is completely a Christian book, then you're teaching heresy. If you say that the book of First John is completely tribulation, you are teaching heresy. You got to understand that the general epistle consists of tribulation and Christian application. That is important to understand. Now, I'm not going to get all expounding on that. Watch my video, Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation, and you'll clearly understand why. It will be very eye-opening. If you think it, only, it cleanly divides only Christian, only tribulation for one book, then trust me, the Bible is not going to make that much more sense. It's going to be more confusion that you're going to have to play a juggling with. So trust me, if you uh, watch the video, then you're going to see why that double application will make things more clear for your Bible reading. Give it a shot. Okay, anyways, let's look at this eternal security verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God, are you born of God? Amen. Doth not commit sin. Wow! Why? For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. See, it's because of your spiritual seed in you. So what God is looking at is your spiritual seed in you, not your fleshy seed, not your fleshy outward actions. He's only looking at the spiritual nature. See that? That's why you cannot sin. Wow, that's a blessing. Chapter 5, verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but, that, but he is begotten of God, keepeth himself, and that wicked one, what? Toucheth him not. Ain't that something to scream and shout about? Amen. Satan, <clears throat> basically Satan cannot touch you, and sin cannot touch you. you now, if you want to chop this off of your Christian application, then you're missing a huge blessing right here. But me, I, I don't want to miss out a huge blessing. You can miss it out if you want. I don't want to miss out the blessing. I want that verse to apply to me. I want some application to me in that verse so that I can rejoice and shout. Okay, the other one concerning eternal security, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, verse 38. Here's another famous passage, Romans chapter 8 and verse 38. Here is another famous passage on eternal security. This verse, you probably heard it in churches before, but they don't understand that if, you, if they quote that so much, they got to understand this should apply to them in their salvation. This verse is so great in showing that anything you list, anything you list cannot separate you cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing cannot separate you from God's love and being in Christ. You cannot get out of Christ. You're in Him. Nothing can't separate you from that. What if God's going to send me to hell out of his anger and justice? No, nothing can separate you from his love. For I am persuaded, wow, that's strong, he's fully convinced, that neither death nor life, so anything you do in this life can't separate you, death can't separate you, nor angels, the angels can't condemn you, nor principalities, the governments of this world cannot condemn you, uh, demonic spirits cannot condemn you, so that's nor powers concerning government, nor things present, look at that, even what you do right now cannot affect you, nor things to come, whatever you do in the future cannot affect you, nor height, that's heaven, nor death, hell cannot even do it, nor any other creature, wow, that's even more powerful, nothing, absolutely nothing else, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ain't that a great verse to memorize? 
one of the most favorite verses. All right. Ephesians. <clears throat> nope, not Ephesians. We're going to look at, I'm trying to go through, ah, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. This is one of the favorites for eternal security is Colossians 2. Colossians 2 is one of the favorites on eternal security. A lot of people actually don't know this, believe it or not. I think only Bible believers, not even independent fundamental Baptists, know this verse as much. It's only Bible believers. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 is going to be a favorite. Now why is that? In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So notice right here, you are circumcised that is not a physical circumcision of physical hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision means a bodily cutting off. So the question is, what is God bodily cutting us off from? Your whole body of sin. So you are separated from body of sins. So you know why this is so powerful? No, one, it actually admitted that your body still sins. And it showed that you're not a part of that. So no matter what sin you commit in your body, it cannot affect you. Because God did a dividing. He cut you off. Because when he cut you off, he divided you from your body of sins. Who's obviously the real you? Is it your body or soul? Soul. Who goes to heaven and hell? Body or soul? Soul. So see, God cut your soul from your body. That's what it means. Amen. That's powerful. You see why this is a favorite for eternal security? Another verse. Now these are powerful verses as well. Is Romans chapter 4. Now, these go hand in hand, Romans 4 and Romans 11. Now, this is a verse that you should actually mark down because this is powerful against cults. Cults, including lordship salvation, lordship salvation is a heretical Calvinist doctrine that teaches, oh yeah, we believe faith alone without works. They admit that. But they think that because you have this faith alone, this faith alone has works in it. It's active. It's not empty. So if your Christian faith has no works in it, then they automatically say that you're lost. Now, one, that's not considered faith alone. That's faith and works, if you're going to be honest. Okay, that's just playing with words. But two, look at what the Bible says. This is powerful. Jehovah Witnesses and Catholics are resorting to lordship salvation arguments, you've got to understand. So you got to be careful of those guys. This will shut them up. Just show them these two verses, and they can't, wringle or they can't wiggle around it. Yeah. Verse 4, Now to him that worketh, if you work, is the reward not what? Reckoned of grace, but of debt. It's automatically counted not grace if you work. Oh, I'm saved by grace, but if I'm truly saved by grace, I work. Okay, then you're not even saved by grace. Yeah. Verse 4, let's keep reading. But to him that worketh not, I didn't work at all. Oh, then you're lost. You're not truly saved by grace. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, I only believe, his faith is automatically what? Counted for righteousness. Now, Romans 11 is even stronger, actually. Romans 11, 6. You know why Romans 11, 6 is even more powerful? Because if you truly believe that this genuine salvation by grace equals some sort of work in your life, then you automatically get rid of the definition of works. Then works does not mean work. It means grace. And grace does not mean grace. It means work. But look at Romans eleven six. 6. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more what? Grace, otherwise work is no more work. Wow, that's powerful. Use these two verses. Jehovah Witnesses, they always like to talk back. I'm, I'm assuming they had a, that kind of habit growing up in their childhood of talking back to their parents. So probably that's the reason why when you try to show them scripture, they always like to talk back. All right, now I'm being sarcastic, but the thing is, is that, the thing is, is that 
In Romans chapter 11, verse 6, as soon as I show them that, all their smart, educated, talking back, jibber-jabber, theological semantics, just stop. Yeah. So that's why I truly recommend these two verses. Please use these verses. If you show them Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, guess what they're going to do? They're going to agree with you. They're going to agree. They, they've gotten very slippery. They've gotten very slippery concerning about not saved by works, but by grace. So you need to use these two verses against the cults. They're very powerful. Okay, another verse. Now, this is one of my favorites. is 1 Timothy. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. What if I don't believe in Jesus Christ anymore? Well, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ anymore, you're lost. You're going to hell. Now, believe it or not, there are some cultic fringe pastors that you've got to watch out, and they will claim to be KJV only, but these knuckleheads, they will brag about how many souls that they led to Christ for salvation, but they actually teach that if you stop believing in Jesus, you're not saved. Why, their lordship salvation then. They think that you have to continue to believe. It's not once saved, always saved. See, these guys are a bunch of liars then. These guys are a bunch of liars. Well, 1 Timothy chapter 2, or excuse me, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy. It's not 1st, I apologize. And that does not look like a 2, so let me erase that. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, and then let me read the verse right here, starting at verse... Uh, let's see here, 2 Timothy 2, I'm in the wrong page. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Okay, it's a faithful saying, when you die, you will live with Jesus. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If you suffer, you can reign with Christ. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, it's funny, people will use this verse to prove that God will deny you when you deny Jesus. No, that's not true. The context of verse 12 is what? Rain. By the way, what's the point of verse 11 then? Faithful saying. That this is talking about some kind of security being with Jesus. And let's assume that you deny Jesus. You don't believe in Jesus anymore. Why does it contradict verse 13? If we believe not, yet he what? Abideth faithful, he cannot what? See that? So verse 12 is so obvious. It's talking about your reign. So God's going to deny your reign if you don't suffer for him. But verse 13 shows it doesn't matter if you stop believing on Jesus Christ and you reject him with full denial. That verse says that if, even if you don't believe, he abides faithful. Wow, isn't that a miracle? If you no longer believe in Christ, God says you're still secured. You're still secured no matter what. That's a powerful verse to use. Well, if I stop believing in Jesus, you're still eternally secured. Because what God is looking at is that when you were saved by faith in personally saying, I'm trusting in the blood of Christ, and at that moment, God sealed you. You think that God's going to break his seal? Seal means seal, and it's at that one specific instance. It's not a continual process. Salvation is not a process, folks. It is an instantaneous moment by the power of God. It doesn't rely on your efforts or a process by how well you're doing in life. Okay, we're also going to look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This is another famous verse on eternal security. Now, did you ever notice when I mentioned about famous verses, it's relating to John? John is filled with so many passages on eternal security. That's why it is laughable that you would reject this for application to a Christian. John is filled with verses that is needful to defend Christian doctrine, once saved, always saved. Not losing salvation. Look at the book of John, chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he what? Power. If you received on Christ, you, he gave you power to become the sons of God. Even to them 
uh, that believe on his name. So notice right here, when you receive Jesus Christ for your salvation, you automatically became his son. Uh, just let me know if I'm out of bounds, camera. You receive Christ, then you automatically become his son. You automatically become his son. Now let me give a simple example right here. Let's say that you and your father has a, have a bad relationship. You failed your father. You let your father down. You sinned against your father. And your father even kicked you out of the house and doesn't want to talk to you anymore. Does that mean the son is not no longer the father's son? No, because biologically, no matter what you do, he will always be his son. Likewise, no matter how bad your relationship is with your heavenly father, even when you sinned against him, and even when he casts you off from fellowshipping with him because your Christian walk is so bad, that cannot deny, that cannot deny your sonship status with God. That's powerful. No matter what, see, no matter what, you will always be a son. That's why this verse is very popular. It is first, uh, not first, John chapter 1, verse 12. Some other verses that we can turn to. Now, this one is the favorite ones concerning sin, okay? Here are verses that you can use concerning when you sin. Is, which is very powerful, extremely powerful. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then verse 1, and then it's going to be 13 through 15. If you don't believe that a Christian who sins, <clears throat> especially if he sins really wickedly, cannot go to heaven, then what's the point of the judgment seat of Christ then? The judgment seat of Christ shows people whose works are so bad that they even get nothing. Then what's the point of that judgment if there is no such thing as a Christian who works really bad? Amen. That's powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul Washer once said, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. He's carnal for saying that. He is carnal for saying that. <laughs> I don't care how spiritually pious he is. He is carnal for saying that. That is of his flesh, where he wants to say that because he has such frustration of Christians who backslid and live wicked lives. That is fleshy. You, if you have so much of spiritual rightness in you, you're going to show patience with that kind of person and understanding as well. Realizing that, hey, you could have been in the same boat. Yeah, bless God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto what? Carnal. See, even as unto what? Babes. Babes in Christ. And there's no such thing as a baby Christian that you can accuse Christians who lived wicked lives of, who lived fleshy lives. Here's another thing. We're also going to look. Here's the powerful one, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire, so one day there will be a day where you're going to be tested by fire. And this fire is going to try, test every man's what? Work of what sort it is. See, God's going to test your work. Well, what if I'm so bad that I'm going to burn in hell? No, look at verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So here's a guy's work that is good. He receives a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Look at this. He lost all of his work. His work is so bad <clears throat> that he got absolutely nothing. Does that mean he's definitely going to go to hell because there's, nothing, there's not a single good work in him? No. Look at the next part. But he himself shall be what? Saved yet so as by fire. Look at that. The fire does not even touch him. He's saved out of the fire. The fire only burns his works. So notice right here, if your works are evil, God will judge every evil work. Amen? Yeah, he will. He cannot compromise that. So if a Christian has an evil work, oh man, I'm going to burn in hell. No, the verse says the fire does not even touch him. Uh, let's put backslider here. 
See, the backslider cannot be touched by the fire, even if he has evil works. Another one is Ephesians chapter 4. This is powerful. Oh, yeah. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Mm -hmm. No matter how many times you sin, a sinning Christian, you can sin all the way to the rapture and you're sealed. Wow. Wow. A sinning Christian is sealed till the rapture. That's powerful. What if this Christian, he messed up his life and lived in sin till the day he died? Oh, he can't be saved. No, he's going to get raptured. What? So this verse not only says that he's going to heaven, but he's going to get raptured too. So it's not like you have to follow a qualification to get raptured. No, all you have to do is be saved in Jesus Christ. You're automatically raptured. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. See, people can grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are what? Sealed unto the day of redemption. See, you're sealed all the way till the rapture, even if you grieve the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a matter of fact that is plain as a nose on your face from Scripture? Another thing is... 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is extremely powerful. I get so many people online who fear about, man, pastor, I just messed up in sin again, and I don't know if my repentance was really repentance right there. Oh, yeah. And no matter how many times I repent, I mess up, and I'm worried about my salvation. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. No, when you repented as a sinner who puts his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, you got to realize this. Just like if you don't believe anymore, just like you don't repent anymore, that means you're still saved no matter what. What? You're serious, Pastor? Yeah, because look at these sins that these saved Christians didn't repent of, and they're saved. What? You serious? Yeah, like I said in Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly what? Beloved for your edifying. Now notice that Paul calls them beloved, yes? All right, now compare that with Ephesians 1. We're going to turn there before you call Pastor Kim a heretic. So we're going to look at that, Ephesians chapter 1. I don't want people to think, oh, Pastor Kim just automatically made it up just because you're called beloved. Uh, that you're saved. Uh, what, what does he mean by that? Well, I'm sorry to say, I guess you don't read your Bible. Come on, come on. That term is used for eternal security. Amen. If you're made in the beloved, that's predestination, actually. Mm -hmm. That's how strong it is. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the what? Oh my goodness. Okay, so you can't undo that. Okay, they're predestinated at verse 19. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 12, 19. Okay, so notice right here, they're predestinated. You can't do anything about it. You can kick and scream, and it doesn't matter what you say. OSAS is wrong, OSAS is wrong. You can kick and scream, write wrong comments, dirty comments on our video. You're not going to change what the Bible says. I'm sorry. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19, we saw that. He's speaking to those made in the beloved, right? Now look at verse 20. For I fear lest when I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as he would not, lest there be, look at this, debates, envyings, wraths, strives, backbitings, whispering, swelling tumults. Wow, look at this. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have what? Sinned already, and have not what? Have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Lasciviousness is a really dirty, yeah. dirty sin. Now, what are you going to do with that? There's nothing you can do about that. Nothing. I'm really sorry. So based on Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you got a powerful block right here. The powerful block is that 
even a person is still saved, still saved when there are things in his later life that he did not repent of. He's still saved even when he didn't repent later on in his walk with Jesus Christ. Okay, so these are all the verses on eternal security. I'm going to uh, leave that column on. I trust that all of you were able to write down this column right here. We did go verse by verse, so you had plenty of time to write. So I'm going to erase this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's another verse that even when you sin, you're still saved. Man, it's amazing. That's why, do you see why you have to rightly divide the Bible? When there are verses that do show that you can lose your salvation, uh, you have to keep the faith. There should be works involved. You understand this. It's simple. Just rightly divide it. Yeah. Rightly divide. That's why I keep recommending watch Amazing Dispensational Truth, and then you'll understand. You're going to understand. Because what are you going to do with these verses that show these people are undoubtedly eternally secure no matter what sin they commit? What are you going to do with these verses? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What if you commit a really wicked sin? A really wicked sin. Well, if you commit a really wicked sin, guess what? You're still saved. What? You're kidding me. Yep. Even if you commit the sin of incest, you got to realize this. That person is still saved. Sometimes I know it's hard to believe when we see a certain person who can be so wicked, do something extremely evil, and sometimes we wonder, I wonder if that person is saved. Like I had some members in my church, even some pastors, who are like telling me, man, Pastor Kim, how can, how can that pastor who accused you, this cult pastor who accused you online, who's anti-Semitic and post-trib and he's a nut job, and he wants to take uh, breathing lessons from Pastor Kim and use as a montage to criticize him oh, yeah. <laughs> and troll inside people's church. And he's so immature. He accuses our church of being immature when he himself is completely immature. That's why they have to grow a beard to look mature. That way they can look 10 years older. But the, how, Pastor Kim, how, I mean, are you sure that person can be saved? Such a person can be saved? And yeah, I'll tell them, man, it's hard to believe, I get it, but yeah, that person is saved if, as a repentant sinner, he trusted in the blood of Christ for his salvation. That's hard to believe, Pastor. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 5.1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Yeah. Now, look at this. This is a sexual sin that should not even be mentioned yeah. in, among people. So e Gentiles, Gentiles are lost people, folks. So this is even a sin that lost people wouldn't even do. Let's keep reading. That one should have his what? Father's wife. He slept with his father's wife. That's disgusting. Now look at verse 4, though, okay? Uh, look at verse 5, verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan. So notice he's turned over to Satan. For the what? Destruction of the flesh. That the what? Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is an extremely powerful verse because it shows two things. It shows, one, the most wicked, heinous sin, wicked, heinous sin committed by a saved Christian, he is still saved as long as he as a repentant sinner, put his trust in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ a long time ago. And it doesn't matter what other sin he commits in the future in his life. He's still saved. Man, that is so hard to believe. But here's another thing. Even if you're demon-possessed, see, he was turned over to the devil, right? His body was turned over to Satan. Yet his spirit is still what? That is powerful. You see how strong we believe in eternal security? This strong, man. Uh, I don't know why I put number one. That should be number 14. <laughs> so this is number 14. See, that is incredibly powerful right there. 
Now, there are so many verses on eternal security, but I did not mention these other verses because they weren't as important. So you don't have to worry about not writing these down. But in case people want to, okay, uh, I will mention this in the video, and then you can just rewind and write it. But don't worry, you don't have to write these. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 30 through 34. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. Uh, let's see right here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 29. John chapter 20, verse 29. And Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Now, I would like to close it with this, actually, though, is Romans 14, 23. This is a great verse for eternal security that I'd like to close with. So I mentioned this one. I gave three verses right here. Romans 14, 23, John 20. 29, they go hand in hand, as well as Luke 12, 29. So unfortunately, I just have to simply explain. I can't write it here. But I wrote you the verses so you can write it down. You know what these verses show? God actually condemns. God actually criticizes and judges a Christian who lives in doubt. That's, right, yeah. that's, a power, that's why I had to write this. You know what's a powerful point for eternal security? If you doubt it, if you live your life in doubting, then you are sinning against God. That is powerful for eternal security. You live your life in doubt, then you are sinning against God. Do you believe once saved, always saved as a result? Now, that's very powerful. It's extremely strong. Okay, so your homework assignment, I will assign it to you uh, after this teaching. So... The homework assignment is you're going to be watching a video. It's called um, Easy Believism, Lordship, Salvation, and Repentance. Easy Believism, Lordship, Salvation, and Repentance. That's a video that you can watch. That will be your homework assignment. And I'll be sure to post the link in the bottom of the video. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearer rather than an offense and a burden. You know, you know how much I love precious souls out there. And I pray, dear Lord God, that they accepted this with a loving and accepting heart. And they saw Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, working in this teaching rather than flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe 
only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried, and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.